morning, everybody, uh, witnesses, committee, members of the public. We're going to start on 226 this morning, our omnibus housing bill. And we have uh, two advocates, uh, I would say, probably for uh, tenants and homeowners is their primary focus or the people who don't have homes. Um, so Brenda, why don't you start us off however you want to, whatever order you want. We have about 20 minutes allocated for the two of you. Okay. Um, I just want to apologize. I think Josh is not well, and so he is not going to be here today. And so I have now um, represented his story uh, within my testimony for that 20 minutes. So as, as part of that 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you all for having me. And for the record, I'm Brenda Siegel from Newfane, Vermont. And I'm speaking on behalf of myself, Josh Lizenby, and Addie Lensner, who we've all been working on housing. We, while, what many of you know is that last fall, Josh Lizenby and I, uh, currently, and Josh, who's currently experiencing homelessness, spent 27 nights and 28 days sleeping on the state house steps in sometimes brutally cold weather uh, to successfully ensure that the most vulnerable population had safe and consistent housing um, and shelter throughout the winter. What you may not know is that this effort was actually tied to an effort that Josh, Addy, and I have been involved in for about a year and beyond for some of us to come up with a long-term permanent housing plan that seeks not only to address the systemic barriers to accessing or keeping permanent housing, but also to solve the long-term housing crisis that Vermont is experiencing now and was looming before the pandemic. Before I go any further though, I wanna share with you a little bit about what I know about Josh's Lizenby's story, and I'm hoping to do it justice since he could not be here today. Josh lives in Virgins. He grew up around Middlebury and he began experiencing homelessness about six years ago. But his housing insecurity has been longer than that. In the time that he has been homeless, he has tried unsuccessfully to use the GA program in times of cold weather, lived in a tent, slept in gazebos and at local parks parks. He has been de dehumanized, stigmatized, and all of this contributed to a deep struggle with depression and even a challenge having any hope that he will ever find his way out of this experience. There were years when he tried unsuccessfully to access permanent housing without the offer to access or access to supportive services that are supposed to be available and offered at shelters and community centers that he was staying in, but did not exist. This led to the belief that there was just no way out. And frankly, in my experience supporting people in this situation through our hotline, the way out is not even on the horizon at this point for much of the population, especially for those that are currently experiencing houselessness. He was bounced from shelter to the street and back again. He was made to stand outside for hours and below freezing and even below zero weather without a proper gear or assurance that he would end up inside. He watched a friend of his get stuck outside for not show, for showing up five minutes late to a shelter. And that friend slept outside. In the morning, as Josh describes it, he watched his friend's cold, frozen, and dead body be picked up by the ambulance. It was not until Josh accessed the pandemic era GA motel program that he began to get the services he needed. He was in one place. He was supported in getting the documentation, health insurance, and even registered vote. He was able to put his mind at ease because he knew that the program, that he would be in one place and that he would not be outside. And then he was removed, but he was one of the lucky ones and he ended up at the John Graham shelter where he can close and lock his door, take personal space when things get overwhelming and have agency and independence over his own life. Also at John Graham, he began to have good support in understanding and working through the process and access to permanent housing. Josh has been denied permanent housing for reasons like not having landlord references by places that are specifically supposed to serve folks experiencing homelessness. Again, Josh is fortunate, one of the lucky ones, because John Graham has an MOU that may, hopefully will, allow him to eventually access a single room occupancy. At 46 years old, all Josh wants is to move, move on 
from this phase, as the governor has set, frequently said at his press conference, people like him should. And maybe this time, he will be lucky. Maybe he won't give up. Maybe he will make it through the process and land in a single room occupancy with the support he needs to eventually move on to an apartment. That part of his story is yet to be determined. But I have never met someone more willing to fight for everyone else or more deserving to leap this hurdle. I want to reiterate that even the sliver of opportunity that Josh has right now is not available to most and changing that requires you all to make meaningful change in how you address access to permanent housing. Federal rules and regulations make every step of this process of accessing permanent housing ruling, which I'm sure you've heard. Josh is lucky that he has support because it would be very easy for him to give up again. If you do all that you have outlined in this bill and don't better fund the housing authorities change charge with reviewing vouchers, so that they can hire staff and commiserate and commensurate with need, and then it won't matter how much more housing there is because people in poverty will not be able to access it. If you don't address systemic barriers to being offered housing for low and moderate income folks, then it won't change the outcome for many. If you don't tie into some of these measures a requirement that makes housing low income accessible, have impacted individuals around their housing needs, have them at the table, and then you won't touch the need because our state is made up of mostly low, moderate and middle income folks. So without measures to protect them, you then we miss the mark. I went through the bill and found a lot of places where I think small tweaks or slight language changes could be made in order to make each part, each of the parts of this bill reach its intended out audience in a more meaningful way. I'm going to submit those in detail in the next few days because I know you have very little time and we'll email you each a copy so that you have it over town meeting week to take a look. As I said in the beginning of the this testimony, just a testimony, Josh, Addy and I embarked on an information gathering project in order to create a long-term plan that would meet need in our state. I will submit the end, the, the end result of that plan along with my written testimony. In our research, we talked with realtors, lived experience experts, meaning housing insecure, those experiencing homelessness, moderate and middle income folks who utilize the rental market or would like to purchase homes. We also spoke with town and city planners, clerks, select board and city council members, lots of building owners and more. Our goal was to find the most thorough, sustainable and rapid way to address the current housing crisis in Vermont. In it is my concern that we are in a huge crisis and this bill is kind of like a 10 year plan that starts at step 10 and misses some of the steps in between. We need to fill in those gaps and I actually don't think it would take anything more than small tweaks in most cases uh, to make a meaningful, uh, meaningful for the majority of the population who is right now unable to move here, purchase here, stay here, rent here or be housed. <laughs> That is not just people experiencing homelessness or low income people, it's everyone except the most wealthy in our state right now. It's bleak and not tenable. In our time on the state house steps, we actually met many upper middle income families who were living in their cars, not because they could not afford housing, but because their landlord had no cause evicted them or sold the house in a seller's market and they simply could not break back into the housing market. It's not just more housing is that we need to solve the problem. We have to reach that market. I wanna begin by really complimenting the section on mobile homes, which actually I'll come back to in a few minutes as well. Uh, and I wanna take a chunk of the time to ex discuss accessory dwelling units, which we discovered in our data gathering as one of the fastest ways to add more long-term housing to the market and has a multitude of unsung benefits as well. But first, I wanna highlight a few places as examples of where I think small tweaks could make change. First, in the section on muni muni municipal and regional land banks. This is less of a small tweak, and I'll provide a detailed explanation of written testimony. But the bill says how to form and how to dissolve a land bank, but it misses some of the comprehensive outline in between um, that place. So I don't know if you'll be able to address that on the Senate side, but it's something that would be able to be addressed perhaps on the House side. Um, page two, line five of the establishment under establishment and authority, it says, it reads, the application of the agency shall describe the types of property to six, B, 
be required, I might have just, I might have the lines in here, to be required, the plan for financing its acquisition, the anticipation, anticipated economic benefits, the source of revenues for any loan, bond, or lease payments, and plans to reten for retention and disbursement of ac excess revenues, if any. It does not say that the application must include who the land acquisition is intended to benefit. And I think that would be a small tweak that could actually um, help ensure that we're meeting that mark. In the next session on, section on housing permit reform, I was excited about the idea of more city town centered housing, however concerned that it seems to codify some of the federal law into our state zoning restrictions and laws and might actually make it harder for smaller builders to build, um, es especially small business owners. Um, and so it might end up favoring larger business owners. An example of how this is problematic is in Middlebury. There is a great need for more housing that will and a will to build it, but there is no buildable land that meets these requirements that are in the bill right now in village centers, which is why they have not been able to build that new affordable housing. This seems to add those, some of those federal restrictions to state restriction, which seems, uh, what seems unclear is, is there funding that is tied so that they could meet these requirements? And I think funding would actually help that to some extent. In the creation of the downtown development districts, I'm really excited that it allows for municipalities to apply for a downtown development district where a traditional downtown designation doesn't exist as someone who's in a rural community right now. I appreciate that that supports the rural communities. I'm also excited about requiring the allowance of affordable housing in all municipalities. This has been a huge barrier as the not in my backyard is often the response to affordable housing attempt, attempt in, in many of our communities. To make up the area development housing task force, the makeup of the area development house, house force, housing task force is really good. I love that it includes advocates. I would suggest that it also includes lived experience ex experts from both low and moderate income backgrounds, as well as someone who has experienced or is currently experiencing homelessness. That would help address some of those barriers when we're looking at the task force and come up, that come up for these populations because you often don't know unless you're experiencing it, what's actually happening on that end. On page 18 in funding housing smart growth principles, I would suggest language that more firmly requires the funding to tie to these principles. When we use words like where possible, a savvy developer with less intent, with less good intent might be able to find ways to say this is not possible and those without power or less resources and knowledge will likely be unable to combat that or even know that it's happening before the process begins. The list of what should be addressed for this funding is a really, really good list. I just think it needs more teeth to ensure that it, it gets met. I have some thoughts about the Homelessness Bill of Rights, but in the interest of time, I'm going to provide that in the written testimony and at, on the House side again, because also I know that's their, their brainchild. I want to really comment um, on the mobile relocation incentives section of this bill. It really addresses the need to update and replace outdated housing stock in an extremely important sector. I also like that it combats stigma of this sector. Uh, and in, this is an ex inexpensive way to house a lot of people with dignity and autonomy if we can address the stigma. There, the commercial property conversion section is a good section. I think it would help to address some zoning issues with this and also tie that funding to creating affordable housing because this is going to be an excellent way to begin to address access to ho permanent housing for folks who, who are tra traditionally difficult to house. So I think the affordable housing tie has to be there. What I'm not seeing yet, but I can't tell if I missed it, <laughs> I reread the bill several times to try to find it, is the accessory dwelling units. Is that in there somewhere that I'm missing it? You may uh, not be seeing the latest version. It's uh, in, it's on pages four, it begins on in a uh, sections, um, uh, it, it begins on page uh, 45 of draft 6.1. Okay. And it, it got popped in, uh, it, we'd been working on it, but it got popped in just a, a couple days ago. 
It begins on page 45 of 6.1 and it's section 20. Okay. It wasn't on the website. And so I didn't download it. I haven't looked at it yet. So forgive me if you've included these things already, but I'll tell you what I think should be included in accessory dwelling units. I, um, and it, uh, this was a big place where we put a lot of focus because an, a homeowner, as you might probably know, does not need additional zoning to build an accessory dwelling unit um, that is one third of the square footage of their home. And this provides a really rapid source of increasing permanent housing. And the reason that I favor this in a lot of ways is that it creates a pathway for both long-term housing and a way to keep people in their homes who may be struggling financially or who may have the opportunity to inherit a home but cannot afford the, ex the expenses that go along with it. Now, this only works this way if we create a funding structure that is accessible to low-income families, and that means granting funds that neither are matching funds or rebates uh, to families of certain income categories. So those income categories would perhaps have a different way to access the funding. Very low and moderate income Vermonters often lose their homes or have to sell an inherited home to lose it to foreclosure. Accessory dwelling units gives an option for families like this. The ADUs need to be required to be long-term, not short-term housing. I think that has to be in there. And it does not, uh, or it doesn't solve the housing crisis in any way. And I would suggest that the bill overall address short-term housing, if possible. Perhaps that gets dealt with on the house side also. Um, <laughs> because in many of our communities, including mine and Newfane, short-term housing is taking up most of the housing stock. And I don't see that this bill is addressing that anywhere. Uh, Brenda, we addressed it in uh, S210, uh, uh, a bill okay. already passed out. Okay, I didn't see that. Thank you for, thank you for letting me know. Every year we noodle away at it. And uh, <laughs> we've, as you know, done quite a bit of work over the last yeah. three years, but it's in S210. Okay, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, now, what is missing uh, from this bill? There are many tenant protections and zoning changes that create geographic equity that should be included if we were looking at long-term housing plan to meet need, and I'll put those in writing. Um, I don't actually think they'd be, some of them might be tough sells for the governor, but some of them might not even be tough sells for the governor, and so they might be things that we can include. Um, I would also suggest adding to this bill a study that, a study, even though we are study heavy state to assess the need, what the need is and how to put in place a plan that ties development and rehab to the actual housing need and gets ahead of it. So we don't end up in this situation again, where we are right now. I'd suggest that this study be made up of 35% lived experience experts, 35% housing advocates and service providers and service providers and 30% builders, municipalities and other interests. Why this makeup? Because what we are assessing in this study would be need and how to meet the need. And so we really must have the, that be a heavy, heavily weighted on experts that, uh, that work on addressing the need every day. I appreciate the hard work that was done in creating this meaty bill. And I ask you all to go back and make, these, make some tweaks because I think this can be done with mostly tweaks where you could, do better to address need as it ties to funding, construction and impact for tenants, homeowners and buyers. In other words, the human beings that the bill is intended to impact. Again, I am going to provide written testimony that addresses specifics in each section, as well as some around accessibility, uh, both physical accessibility and uh, accessibility in terms of income accessibility. And I hope that to get that all to you by Monday, though I know you'll be on break, but I hope you'll have a chance to look, and look it over. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about our research. I definitely uh, was fun and interesting to read through your 34 pages of that bill. <laughs> so, uh, Brenda, thanks so much, but I just wanna make sure that you don't uh, spend time on a, on, on a draft that, that you aren't, that, you know, spend time on the right draft. And at the moment <laughs> that is on our website and it's 6.1. So take that as your starting okay. point. I think some of your things have been addressed. Okay. Okay, great. I will take that as my starting point. Yeah. Michael, you're muted. Thank, thank you, Brenda. We will read what you send in and we have time over the break. 
Uh, we'll be busy during the break as well uh, to looking at that stuff and see if those tweaks uh, make sense to our bill or whether to leave them to the house to work up. Uh, but as Senator Clarkson said, the bill has gone through several iterations and uh, you might want to you know, limit your comments to the sections that are in the bill. But if you see something that's missing and you're horrified that we took it out, you can, you can mention that as well. Chris. We have added and taken out along the way, so. I will, and I don't know if it's like my computer not updating or what. This, I, latest, when I... this, this latest draft was just posted this morning. Oh, okay, so okay. We're gonna be walking through it, so you may wanna stay tuned. I, I, if you don't mind, I will, okay. I'll mute. But if there's any other questions, happy to answer. And, uh, and I apologize for anything you've already addressed that I didn't know you had addressed yet. And I appreciate you staying within the time frame we suggested because we are really pressed for time. So thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Uh, give our regards to Josh and we will uh, we'll move on. Um, we have with David Hall and Ellen, I think, who are going to tag team us through this bill for the next 70 minutes or so, and then we'll take a break. I'm hopeful that we can get through the entire bill such that we can present you with a uh, an almost final version when you when we all come back on the following Tuesday and fingers crossed, we can vote the bill out on that day. So um, I'm gonna leave it to, uh, I think the best way to do this, if, if you haven't, you should print out the latest version of the bill and the, the section by section summary that David and Ellen have so artfully prepared. So, where, Michael, where is the section by section summary? I guess I haven't seen that. And are we operating, David, on 6.1? Yes. 6.1, yes. David, okay. uh, where if, if is we the section if we, by if we section? If we didn't get that posted, David, could you send that out to the committee now? Uh, I, I posted it. I posted it's the it. Sub, it's the summary table? Correct. Oh, great. Okay, good. Sorry, I had not seen that till now. We'll, we'll go on. We'll put it on a shared screen, but I think it's good if people want to. Oh, it's great. It, yeah. To have it printed out in front of them as well. So um, a lot of these sections are obviously very familiar to you, and we've had discussions, I think, to some degree on all of them. And uh, we'll just stop as we go along if there's any concerns or discussion to be had. I, I, I may start out as we get to each se section to tell you my thoughts on the section and then open it up for discussion. Um, so why don't we start uh, uh, with whoever uh, is primarily, uh, this bill is, a mixture of David and Ellen's uh, subject area uh, expertise. Uh, I think the stuff that Becky Wasserman had in this bill is now deleted because it was mostly TIF stuff and we're gonna move that into the economic development bill. I think and it makes- Senator Sorok, and my apologies for interrupting. Ellen might be running late from natural resources this morning. Okay. But she'll be here as soon as she can, just so you know. I have a feeling she may be real late. Okay, let's, yeah. let's, uh, David probably has a working understanding of a lot of the stuff anyhow, so we can pass over stuff that you want to defer to Ellen on. Why don't you get us started, David? Uh, All right, uh, good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. Do you, do you want me to put this up on the screen? I would, uh, you know, I think I would, I think the summary would be better than you know the actual legislation. Uh, it's hard to decipher some of the stuff in the legislation, and people could read that over the break. But the concepts are all in the summary, and that's what we need to discuss. And if, if wording needs to be tweaked along the way, we can do that over the break. OK. Um... <laughs> But if you have a different idea, let us know. I don't. I, I'm just scrolling through the document to uh, 
you know, kind of get a sense of what is mine at this point, since um, right. is much more limited than Ellen's. Um, I'll say that the like section one, for instance, which used to be the municipal and regional land banks is, is out. So that was mine. Um, all of the two sections, which relate to housing and permit reform are Ellen's. Um, three, which used to be mine is out as, and then four, the homeless bill of rights material is out. So that's why you don't have those on your table. Um, so really that brings me to section five, the first generation home buyer incentive program. And, and that what? is uh, a $5 million program through DHCD, working with VHFA and relevant stakeholders to design and implement a program to provide grants of not more than $10,000 for purchase and closing costs for first generation home buyers. I know you guys are still discussing this one. So that's the first stop on my list. Okay. So and what section is it now? It's section five. Right. Section five. Got it. Okay. So my suggestion on this section is it has a, a great deal of similarity with the down payment assistance program that's being run by BHFA. Uh, uh, we don't necessarily have funding sources for any of this at this point. Uh, this one in particular, some of the others could be taken out of VHCB's big pot of money. Uh, but on this one, my preference would be to say to VHFA, uh, find a way to prioritize among your applications or give preferential treatment for down paying assistment to first generation home buyers. I think in a lot of cases, they will be the same people, but if we can give them a little leg up, we can possibly accomplish the same thing. Uh, and we need to, uh, before anybody attacks me on that, you need, we need to be thinking about the overall cost of this bill. And the way the bill was originally drafted, it had like five different pots of money of $5 million each that had no real source. I mean, it, it was ARPA money, but um, it wasn't clear whether it was outside what was being proposed more or within the source of money that um, uh, uh, Gus and BHCB gets. What we talked to, if you recall, on a lot of these things, just as a preview, we talked to Gus and, and Jen, and they said they would be okay with this, is to make it clear that they were enabled to spend up to a certain amount of money out of their proceeds in their discretion if they wanted to. So if they saw a, a possibility of, you know, uh, starting a mini program on commercial conversion or uh, large employers, uh, that they can do it, we're giving them the authority to do it, but we haven't really drilled down on the specifics of what that program would look like at this point. So it wouldn't be a mandate that they do it, but it would give them that discretion and it would give them the signal that the legislature is interested in what I call low hanging fruit. And the reason why I call it low hanging fruit is because it seems like the employer community and the development community have uh, interest in converting commercial space to residential. And they have interest in providing some employee housing. So there could be requirements of significant matching funds and potentially perpetual affordability tied to any funds that BHCB gives. Senator Clarkson. So I actually think, I know you're jumping to the large employer. I'm not jumping, I'm just previewing. Yeah, yeah, okay. When we get there, I have an idea that I, uh, I'd i like to discuss about including in that because I also see it as a potential for some workforce housing within a um, an employment center. So uh, I, I have some other additional ideas. I think we could work... Uh, on during the break on identifying where the 5 million on each of these, uh, the source for those, because I think we have options. There's 
uh, and I would, uh, I, I agree. I'd love to charge VHFA with adding this. I, I, I don't, given the demand on, on the first time home buyer uh, program, I, I'm not sure I'd invade that. I think I'd really want to add to it and make it very specifically for first generation purchasing, but not rating it. I'd love to add to it because I think the need is so substantial. Okay, and I, I just we, we could certainly talk about it at the break, but uh, we we need we, to talk we, about funding we, period. We, yeah, yeah. We keep in mind in all your comments that at least my preference was be to get this bill out in the next legislative day, and we haven't heard testimony in any detail on a lot of these issues, uh, right. and we that haven't heard from what the administration's position would be on raising more money in, in the budget. So uh, just keep that in mind, because I know we could spend a lot of money on a lot of good causes here. Okay, uh, let's go to section six. Section six um, started off in the bill as introduced and it was one of the $5 million pots and um, it has, it, it's in this draft, it is replaced with the language uh, based on Josh Hanford's uh, handout um, that um, has, it's the same amount of money, um, but it is, um, sort of different allocations. So right now, again, it's couches, ARPA funds, um, and we would need to just m make sure we get the right source if that's indeed what you want. This is sort of just generic language in line six. Oh, you're not looking at the draft. You're, that's not on the screen, okay. I forgot. So what we want to focus on is we want to get rid of section six and substitute section six A, which in this case, there's a detailed plan that the advocates in the administration have worked on and found a sort right. of funding for. And uh, so uh, I don't know if, how many people have actually looked at that plan. It was posted and, uh, but it's pretty comprehensive in, in approaching the mobile home uh, problem from a lot of different fronts. And I think it puts close to $6 million into uh, affordable tax credits and grant money. Um, so unless people have problems with that, I'd like to move on. Uh, Michael, just uh, remind, I, I need a reminder, maybe from Scott, about who's testimony that detail is under because I'm not remembering off the top of my head. I think it's under Josh Hanford's. Is it it's under Josh or Jen? Okay. Josh. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. Right. No, I remember it. I just can't remember how okay. we find it because it all has to be by witness. Okay. Okay. So section seven, go ahead, David. Um, so seven and eight are both $5 million DHCD appropriations. Uh, seven is for a large employer housing partnership. And that is a program to provide matching funds, not more than 5,000 per employee for the cost. An employer with 25 or more employees incurs to provide housing for its workforce. That's that's the limit on that. So it doesn't have details like whether this means to purchase or build or rent or move. It's just a grant per employee on a matching basis for large employers. So on these two, uh, and the, the next one is similar, we could add that into the discussion, commercial property conversion incentive program. Uh, uh, what I'm suggesting here is that we produce enabling legislation to allow uh, VHCB to use, to target some of its funds to, uh, to these ideas uh, and require matching funds, uh, significant matching funds to, uh, 
and afford perpetual affordability requirements. Um, I think they already have that power as we witnessed um, with a learning about a new program that I was unaware of called the Innovation Grant that was given to VHFA uh, to do a reserve fund for V for by VHFA to cons for construction loans. Uh, I wasn't aware of that program, but um, you know I think that there's some broad authority of how they can use the money, and this would give a legislative stamp of encouragement that they look into these areas and perhaps fund some sort of uh, examples of how this can work. And I think we recognize that in both of these instances, there's an opportunity here to uh, fill in the gaps to make these things a reality. We're, we're, we're hearing that they don't pencil out right now. So we have commercial units that are standing vacant or hospitals or other people are not being able to buy workforce housing, uh, workforce, yeah. Miss, workforce. Miss, Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, I, I see in section eight, the opportunity for us to address an entrepreneurial hub, not unlike the Black River Innovation Campus, which is, and I think we have a couple others in mind also maybe in the, in the um, accelerator centers we're, we're planning around the state where housing, where entrepreneurs come work and live. And in this renovation of this historic downtown school, it is being developed as a, it is being developed as a commercial property. It also has spaces that could be used as apartments. They, it falls through the cracks. I would love to be able to send David this proposal and see if we could work, pull out threads of this that could expand this and create opportunities again for some square peg housing uh, ideas that are, uh, that are kind of exciting and that bring young people to our downtowns, particularly challenged downtowns that need that kind of energy that would have uh, caps on rental and um, I, I think that we could make this work for some of our uh, innovation hubs in, in a way as well. Um, again, it, it's got the same sort of intent of reusing properties that in our downtowns uh, and getting them occupied with residential, with residents uh, rather than space that is now empty. So send that to David. Uh, again, the, the question is given that we've taken not much testimony on these areas we've got <laughs> people who voice support for it but we certainly haven't taken any testimony on okay. the specifics of the size of the grants and but we right. can work in language in the enabling legislation that you know highlights those kinds of programs as examples right and it would just be great to, if we could mm, maybe add a Anyway, I'll send it to David and David and I can chat about it, but to see what we could pull out of it to help broaden and, and expand this a tiny bit. Okay. Uh, on the chart, uh, section 10 was the three-year extension of the TIFs. Uh, I'll save David from talking about this, but I've asked that to be deleted as late as this morning. I didn't realize it was still in there but I don't think, I think it's much more appropriate for the economic development bill. And in fact, the economic development bill has the mini TIFs in it. And I don't right. know why the TIF extension would travel on a different vehicle. So we're striking. No, it, it makes sense. Home. Good. Uh, David, uh, is section 13 yours? <clears throat> so that skips 11 and 12. 13 municipal bylaw grants is Ellen. Okay. Still is the Ellen show now. Yeah. It, problem. It, problem. Uh, we've done, we're in pretty good shape on this, aren't we? I mean, at the moment. I think so. Uh, let, let's see if anybody has any comments. This is essentially what we passed in S33. Uh, no, S101. S101, I think. S101 yeah. last year. Um, 
which is uh, as passed the Senate. I think it had strong support. I don't think there was any problem. The program, it's another one of these programs that even though uh, S101 didn't pass, the money was in the budget uh, anticipating its passage and uh, the agency has spent the money, has stood up a program. It's oversubscribed and some of the people who are have gotten $20,000 grants will likely need continuation grants. So the idea here is to continue the program for one more year and uh, put in the same amount of appropriation that was in for FY22. But the substantively, we've already dealt with it. Um, if we don't do this, then I would suggest striking the section because the program, all the money's gone from the program. I don't know, not know why we need statutory language uh, to back it up at this point. But if, certainly if we're gonna continue it for another year, and uh, apparently it's very popular and the agency uh, really thinks it's gonna produce yield results. So this is just the continuation of the program for one more year. Uh, Mr. Chair, I thought the governor had, and, and maybe I just missed you, yeah, here it, it's 613 C has 650,000 for it. Right. Right. So, and oh, uh, that may be high, but but also may, we heard from the planners that uh, that this was, you know, we heard from Peter Gregory that it might not need quite so much. But I, I, I think it would be good to keep this as a placeholder for because it's so key to so much of the work we want to have accomplished. They go hand in glove. Is it? Okay. Well, we will keep it in for now. Yeah, I think um, we just need a running tab on our money. Uh, section 14 is downtown tax credits. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. I assume that's Ellen too. We're not. Yes. Yeah. And we could, David and I could uh, fill in the blanks as best we can if Ellen doesn't arrive, but we'll postpone discussion on those in the hopes that she does. Um, on uh, section 15, I think we can uh, deal with this is in 101. It was strongly support, uh, supported by this committee. It's the same language as passed in 101 that uh, gets rid of the duplication of permitting uh, between towns and the state. Uh, so uh, unless there's no objection, we'll have that in. Uh, section 16 through uh, 19 is the bill that Senator Brock put in that's in natural resources now, uh, S270. Um, uh, I have real concerns with uh, actually all the sections, but uh, the one of changing the, 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 the dynamic or the structure of what is affordable housing in the state to go from 80% of median income to 120% of median income. Uh, and uh, I think that really changes who we're focused on in trying to help. And I don't think we're ready to make that change with a lot more discussion. I've even been told that at 120% of median, you might be helping people who could already afford market rate housing. Uh, so uh, that's my, position on that. We'll deal with them one by one. Uh, I don't know how the rest of the committee feels. And I think that's the testimony we heard. Okay. Uh, section uh, 16B. Um, I think that's taken care of elsewhere in this bill. We'll, add, we'll double check with Ellen, but we're trying to avoid having to come back on amendments that might trigger Act 250 uh, and have amendments uh, not have to go through Act 250. 
So that section may be okay. Uh, section 16C, uh, this is the high demand county one. I think we heard that it would focus on just two counties. And I think it could be in essence, we're, we're, even in those counties, we may be pitting affordable housing against smart growth uh, because it would avoid Act 250 even in rural areas of those counties, uh, I think. But uh, uh, even though I think parochially, it would be good for the county I represent, I don't think it's uh, uh, appropriate use of the resources on that section. Well, I guess, you know, I, and I know where the committee stands on these issues, but I would just caution that our goal is to increase the amount of housing stock that is available to deal with a crisis. And these things do some of that, which is why they're being proposed. I mean, I, th I think what it comes down to though, Senator Brock is you could say that, and maybe you would say it about any housing construction. They shouldn't have to go through Act 250 permit. This is a, a, a tranche of that. And we are making head rows in exemptions for Act 250. I think this is too big and it's really targeted at just certain areas of the state. So well, it, it's targeted areas that have a, de a demonstrated need, uh, which is why they're, they're targeted in that fashion. And it doesn't throw out Act 250. It provides simply an alternative way without changing any of the goals or uh, uh, objectives of Act 250. Again, okay. I, you know, I understand your, your position and, uh, and respect it, uh, but I'm saying that there is an alternative view. Okay. Right. But there, the, the sad truth is that uh, affordable housing, uh, housing period is needed in every corner of the state. There, there isn't any one, I mean, in the upper Valley, it's, you know, and I know that includes some of New Hampshire, it's been estimated by our housing, uh, group here that we need 7,500 new units, you know, ASAP. I mean, that, that, that doesn't probably qualify in the same way that you're imagining it, but the need is huge. Okay. okay. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway. Uh, so section 16 D goes along with section 16. Right. C. Um, let's move on to section 17. We heard from joint fiscal that um, that this is going to cost like a million two five growing first year and then a million seven I think in the next year uh, the you know one of the things that uh, I think I said about this I mean I think if we wanted to pursue this we'd have to have the tax commissioner in to make sure that there's no administrative difficulties but I think the way you are likely to go on missing middle that is basically your, um, for those, at least for the missing middle housing, you're, um, uh, you're just diluting the amount of the grant that the, constru the uh, contractor would get because their value gap would be less as a result of this. And this, I, I don't know, I, I think this applies to well, it just applies to priority housing projects. Uh, so priority housing projects would theoretically have some units in it that are afford perpetually affordable, but it could also have a lot of market rate housing in it. And um, I'm just reluctant to go down this road, but I think we can discuss this a little further if you want. Yeah, and one thought I'd had, Mr. Chair, um, is that I wonder if we can make it, uh, if we, you know, given our concern about priority housing projects and only them only having 20% of their units at the moment available for affordable housing, and it's only affordable for 15 years, this is a big stickler for me, um, and a compromise, I'm, that happened, um, that if they use, if a priority housing project uses ARPA money for the duration of ARPA, 
maybe this would be an added incentive for priority housing projects. So they don't get much actually, they get a, a permit, a shortening of the permit period. They don't actually, you know, I think we've heard testimony that priority housing projects, the value to that project uh, for what we give them is pretty modest. Um, but maybe another sweetener for them to build during the ARPA duration, maybe a sweetener would be if they take ARPA money to develop a priority housing project that we would ask them to include 30% and we might have a sales tax exemption just for that short period of time for the, you know, while they build through 26. I would ask anyway. Sarah Clarkson to keep in mind the time frame we're working under here. Right. Um, so that's that's it is to 2026. No, I'm talking right. about the time frame for this committee to get the bill out. Oh, right. Oh, oh, that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think that 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 is an interesting idea, Senator Clarkson. Uh, I, I guess that the one thing that, that I think about in this and similar kinds of amendments is that we find that there isn't any quote affordable unquote housing. And one of the ways to make things affordable is to make them less expensive. This makes it less expensive. It's pretty fundamental. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think we would have to know more about the ramifications of, you know, whether this is uh, proportional to what is um, being given out already to entice private developers to build this this housing. This may be very, this might be a very large item compared to what they're getting now in terms of uh, assistance relative to that and, and the whole perpetual affordability thing. I, I mean, I, I would be willing to look at this further in finance when the bill comes to finance, which it will, uh, I, I would give you my word that we could talk about that there and, and suggest it. But I, I just think that we need to get this bill moving. And I don't think we know all the ramifications yet of this. This is, I mean, whatever we do, 1.7 million of, of benefits to these priority housing projects. Um, and I don't know how many there really are out there, quite frankly. Uh, that are not nonprofits already uh, that don't have to pay the sales and use tax uh, that, um, you know, you know, what we're getting for it. Uh, so I just think that this will slow down the bill. I'd be willing to work with Senator Brock even before the bill gets to finance to try and find all these answers and, uh, uh, if it makes sense, I mean, it's, you know, I, I don't see much difference with this and with funding through VHCB for priority housing projects. Yeah. It's, that it, may be more valuable. As Senator Brock and I both know, this is a tax expenditure. Yep. It's very similar to an appropriation. So yep. uh, it's just another complication at Lowe's and every other place discerning who is qualified, whether it's going to the priority housing project or other units or whatever. Um, do we do we have a notion of how we would replace this 1.7, 1.25 to 1 1.7? Because that's the question with a tax expenditure. That's, I think, the, the thing. Is that whether or not you can make a case uh, in, in, in effect of projecting uh, that the, the value of having increased housing, uh, if you take, say, roughly 3% of the amount of money that you're talking about, which is probably what you would do if you figure that about half of construction expenditure is taxable, represent taxable materials, you could, you could come up with a projection. But the one thing that we, we absolutely have to recognize is you can't expect JFO to do it because that's not what they do. You'll right. never get from JFO a projection on the benefit that you're going to get from something like this. Right. right. I think it is a very fundamental, logical thing to say that if you want to make something affordable, you make it less costly. It's not rocket science. Yes. And I think in all fairness, 
we're trying to do that in this bill. <laughs> That's one of the, the, the guiding principles. However, I think that what we have, I mean, I have a, a lot of questions about it. I mean, these priority housing projects are frequently um, significantly uh, market rate housing. You know, there may be 40 units of market rate housing and 10 units of affordable units in it. Uh, are we, we've already given them the exemption from Act 250. Do we want to give them uh, um, this cost reduction that may benefit the market rate housing as well as the affordable housing? And Senator Clarkson's right, probably inevitably, we're going to have to cut the amount of subsidies we can give to the uh, affordable housing units because we're going to have to replace this 1.7 million. And the logical place to do it is to say, okay, if you're going to give them this credit and the governor has a budget out there and was trying to potentially stay within it, then um, we're going to have to find it somewhere. And it might just be in terms of the appropriation for the the same goal of making housing more affordable. I think this one just doesn't target the money as well as the grants program. So that's where I am on it. Yeah, Senator, and Senator Rahm, do you have a pit opinion? So. No, I'm um, good. Okay. I, I think that's the question though that we're asking, because I think we're all, I think Randy's right. We're trying to make, uh, it, it, in lots of these efforts, trying to make housing less expensive, reduce barriers to building housing in our, in our downtown and village centers. And I guess the question is, what's of greater value to the developer? And uh, only, VHCB only does about a third of the priority housing projects. And the more we look at priority, priority housing projects, yes, it gets housing built. There's no question they're valuable in that regard. But they're in terms of long-term affordability, and I know we keep building them, so we keep replacing the 20 units that go off affordability after 15 years. I, it, it uh, For me, priority housing projects are increasingly becoming projects I'm a little frustrated with in the first place, because two th I don't even know what the universe of priority housing projects is the total units. I know Graham did this calculation for us, but I'm impressed he got a sense of what that total universe was, which I, it, it's unclear to me what the full universe of PHPs is. But anyway. So you, you uh, are, are you wanting to, a move on at least for the moment. We'll continue uh, this conversation. We can. I mean, I'd like to. Um, You'd like to pull it from this now? Is that what you're suggesting? I, I just don't think, in terms of the necessary workup, that we can, with a straight face, pass this out. I'm willing to get in touch with the tax department and others over the break and try to get some more meat on it. But my inclination is just because, uh, just because I think the, we, we give the tax exemption, the Act 250 exemption for priority housing projects because it's hard to develop a whole project of mixed use housing, but not mixed use, mixed income housing. Uh, it, uh, you know, I'd be more comfortable if I knew this was all of this uh, exemption from sales and use tax is going to build affordable housing and not just 10% affordable housing. Um, uh, I think it's a pretty, I think this is, this probably given the numbers we heard, totally subsumes and changes the value of a priority housing project. As we've heard, the value is a shortened time frame for uh, the permit and also $30,000 on average in fees. This is gonna be worth probably a lot more than that. Uh, so we're, it's, a, it's a huge change, I think. 
Anyhow, uh, we'll move on. Uh, we have Ellen with us. That's great. We'll come back to some of the stuff. Let's just keep going forward. Um, on the next two uh, environmental court, court, I know Senator Brock is probably is trying to touch base with, but what we heard from uh, the judge, I think it's going to be hard for you to convince him to support these changes. Uh, so I would say we strike if you, if you want to come back with something. Well, I got a, a, a conference call with him scheduled for Monday, which was the earliest that he was available. That's fine. If you want to come back with some alternative, uh, okay. or if he come, if somehow you can convince him that it doesn't violate separation of powers, or uh, there is a real problem with the environmental court right now. Um, I, I think he was pretty strong and diplomatic, but strong that this was uh, not the direction to go. Uh, on ADUs, whose section is that? Section 20? Two out of three belong to Ellen. Two out of three in section 20 or? No, two out of three period generally. <laughs> well, section 20, 20 is mine. 20, 20 A are Ellen, and then I added a 20 B, not certain if that's what you guys wanted or not, so. Okay, so why don't you, uh, this is, um, I'm trying to remember who offered this proposal to us. Uh, so put, go ahead, so, go ahead. So uh, section 20A amends um, zoning language in Title 24 to prevent a town from requiring more than one parking space per bedroom for an accessory dwelling unit. Okay. That's okay. I was jumping ahead to. Oh. On this, we're we're work, working off this chart, and oh, okay. So section twenty is what you just said. Yeah. Uh, this is. I, I think this is uh, relatively important um, in terms of zoning to promote ADUs, uh, and I think it's not excessive regulation. So um, I think it makes logical sense to, uh, we don't want towns to be able to, uh, we've made, we've, we've made and are trying to make more uh, to facilitate more development of ADUs. We just heard Brenda talk, uh, you know, that ADUs may be a, a, a significant bullet here, silver bullet in doing these things. We heard you know, the lighthouse conference and stuff. So uh, it would be unfortunate if a town went ahead and said, oh, we have all these provisions to allow ADUs, but we want two parking spaces for every, and you don't have the ability to provide that. Um, so I feel that this is a good section and uh, welcome to hear otherwise. Mr. Chair. I, I think I spoke about this the, the other day is it's just to me it doesn't it's not a good practice to make the legislature the zoning board for every municipality in the state and this is is micromanagement when we get to this point if we were to adopt a provision that says that in in general terms uh, that clearly indicates that states desire to see an increase in uh, uh, accessory dwelling units without undue regulation that is designed to limit or pre prevent them to an excessive extent. If, if we were to create general language that allows municipalities to uh, come up with their own solution based on the, the, the peculiarities of their location, uh, what is uh, appropriate in Berkshire is not appropriate in Burlington. And to apply these one size fits all to the state as a whole makes us the zoning board for the state. And I don't think that should be our role. Okay, I could I can live with that. Um, I, I I mean, keep in mind that we have already done that to a far greater degree than the parking situation. Yeah. You know, we, we've mandated a lot of uh, things on the town to promote accessory dwelling units, you know, 900 square feet, you know, all of that stuff that's already in place. This is just another uh, 
Another nail in the coffin. Yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, I don't know exactly how we would phrase that, but if we limited that to the parking issue and say that they shall, you know, their requirements shall, you know, be reasonable and not excessive. And I think you'd wind up with the same result if that makes you feel more comfortable. Well, we have very talented legislative counsel and perhaps we can trust them to come up with uh, uh, wording solutions that may make more sense rather than being as prescriptive as this. Okay, well, I, I would encourage, uh, Ellen, if you could work on some language, I think you've heard the debate, we could take a look at that. I, I, I mean, I think the result is could be the same. The other way to do it would be, you know, to, to have this in there, but to allow waivers or exceptions in unusual circumstances uh, that the town could defend. I mean, I think that's what you're looking for in this one area. You're looking for a little bit of flexibility to the extent that this makes, uh, uh, if, if there is a town like Versure that, you know, no harm's done and they need to tax for some reason for an ADU, they should be allowed to do that. Uh, it May I, I just? I, I could be reasonable. I could yeah. do something like that. But Mr. Chair? Yep. Yeah. So I, I think part of our objective here is to reduce barriers for the, the development of ADUs. And if this is a barrier in a town, it, it, it that's a problem, you know? And I, Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is not a statewide statutory requirement at the moment that there be a one parking place per per uh, bedroom, right? I mean, that's a that's a, a town by town requirement, isn't that right? Right. Currently under the statute, towns have the ability to set parking minimums. Not mm -hmm. all towns do that, some towns do. Right, yeah. and so I think we could have strong language in here uh, because I, I, I do think that for the towns that do have that requirement, I think we should be asking them to review it and <laughs> Uh, because it is an impediment to people, given the space they may or may not have, to building, to having more, more uh, to being able to make more parking. They may be able to do the ADU, but not uh, more parking. It may be one thing or another, given the, the size of their lot. So, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant. I mean, I'm happy to work on language that's more enabling, but... I also know that this is a barrier for people to developing an ADU. Do we know of any town that requires more than one parking spot per bedroom? I mean, practically I'm wondering whether this really is an issue out there. The other way we've dealt with ADUs in the past, when this first starting out and we we're trying to get the nose under the tent on allowing this and the league was opposed uh, for similar reasons that Senator Brock is articulated as we said that at least anybody who was looking for a permit, a building permit to do an ADU by right had the ability to make an appeal under conditional use so they could be heard as to why it wasn't unreasonable for them to get a variance, so to speak, from if a town did have two parking units per bedroom, and that was going to disallow the development of the ADU. At least they could be heard to say, look, you know. So there's a lot of ways to do this to give some more variable or more flexibility. But um, I just don't want, I, you know, I'm not sure we're saying a lot different is just the whether the the methodology of once size fits all is too heavy handed and too inflexible. I think it's going to happen in a very rare case. But let's let's see if Ellen can work on some language and give us some alternatives. To so I think one of the things that you pointed to is our ignorance of what the extent of the effect of this narrow reading is to begin with. And that of in itself says, this is not a wise thing to put in in such an inflexible way. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that we can't accommodate your concern that wouldn't cause any problems. So uh, I, I actually 
will admit, but maybe Ellen knows, uh, was this in 511? Uh, no. So this was one of the proposals um, after you started exploring the ADU uh, definition in, or issue in depth in the last few weeks. There were a number of proposals, I think, from the Department of Things that could potentially um, further assist ADU development. Um, they provided a list. You, you asked me to. Um, this was the only statutory change on that list, I think, possibly or one of the only ones. So this was one of the things that you recommended um, be included. Okay, so this is from uh, uh, maybe that same memo on ADUs from the department yes. based in their experience that this could be a problem. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna track that down and talk to, I guess it would be Chris Cochran and you know, it, it would answer Senator Brock's last question is, you know, is there a problem in this area? So I, I assume there might be if he suggested the language, so. I, I think they did, and we've talked about it before. I mean, because parking is a big issue. Um, so uh, do, do we want to see if Chris could be available? So, uh, uh, you know, we, we can, not right now. Okay. We, we could talk to him over the break and bring him in if need be. So I, I would add one thing related to this, um, and. I don't know the number of towns. I do know one of the issues is that some town zoning states when a new dwelling unit is created, there is a parking minimum. So not all towns actually use number of bedrooms as the, the number that they look to for parking spaces. Some towns do that, but when because the creation of an ADU is essentially an entirely new dwelling unit itself, that sometimes um, lines up with what is required for a house, for example. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. That, that's very revealing. I mean, that's- And conceivably, uh, you could have a new dwelling unit that is two or three bedrooms for that matter. Could you not? Right, 900 square feet can be a pretty big unit. Right, and, and that, would be, that would be fine. If they wanna put three bedrooms in there, they, the town could say you have to have three parking spaces. Uh, this is- but one unit per one parking space per bedroom. So let's 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 move on. We'll 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 talk to Chris and we'll get a little bit more information on this. But I think it's very revealing what Ellen said because that what she said is towns do it not by bedrooms and that could have an adverse effect on yeah. ABUs that you that you otherwise would allow. Um, okay. So can we go to section 28? in the chart? Yes, Mr. Chair, may I just say a, a global thing about this? About what? The whole, all of section 20A. Sure. Um, Ellen would describe it to us real quick first, but- Oh, okay, sorry. This is uh, from, this is from J Jacob. Uh, we asked- This is from Jacob at DH- but, uh, This does not have necessarily the administration support, but I asked him, to put together a laundry list of what a center might do uh, if we decided to go the center route. Uh, I, I know we've probably moved on from this language to, to, this language will need to be modified somewhat, but that's where these ideas came from anyhow. Right, this, yeah, this language is a little rough, but it, it would, and it would need a lot more detail, I think, if you were interested in fully pursuing the creation of a navigation center. Um, right, and, and to Alice, that end, uh, well, my Alice, one- Alice, okay. did, you, did you let her oh. finish? So section 20A appropriates $5.7 million to create an accessory dwelling unit navigation center within the Department of Housing and Commun Community Development or within ACCD and uh, and then it just, uh, yeah, within the department. And then here's just a list of the, the things uh, that the, the center could do, would do. Um, hire a consultant to develop a statewide guidebook for floor potential floor plans and designs for ADUs that can easily be adapted in Vermont. A pilot program to hire local ADU ambassadors to work in towns to provide local assistance on development of ADUs. 
have a central resource uh, database to support pilot communities um, and homeowners statewide interested in building an ADU. So providing materials and training on planning, design and development, working with VHFA to develop a loan loss reserve fund for ADUs, uh, create an ADU down payment grant program for home homeowners, and then a social enterprise pilot program for weatherization and internal conversion to identify workforce. Um, so contractors who do this work and could be, um, you know, listed as the available contractors that do this work. Okay, so before I call on Allison, my thinking on this section is, as you know, the VHIP program, which is traveling in a bunch of different places, I guess, um, the language for that, that we passed on, in S79 that got vetoed, had ADUs as one of the uh, uh, development of ADUs as one of the uh, uh, grantees, a homeowner could get money from the VHIP program to renovate a house, in addition to the majority of the program being on blighted, non code compliant housing rented by a landlord. This was all we threw in ADUs in there as well. My thinking is we should. Uh, and they have not, they said with the $5 million or $7 million they put out on the street, they've only built one ADU so far. Um, I think this committee feels strongly that ADUs are as good of or perhaps better in some respects than the money put towards renovating uh, dilapidated units. Let's say they're on a par. So why shouldn't we say that some of the VHIP money and that was where, what our intent, the statutory language was, was to go to ADUs. But we should, in my mind, we should say a certain percentage up, you know, a certain percentage should go to ADUs going forward with the following strings attached. As opposed to a navigation center, we would just change the language in 210 uh, that's going out there now and um, say it in this bill, notwithstanding any other provision that may be enacted in law on the VHIP program, the ADU shall receive, I have 25% of the appropriation and it should be, and set some general program guidelines for them to develop. We could use the same guidelines that exist for blighted property, like uh, there has to be at least a 20% buy-in from the homeowner. The grant could be up to 30,000. The administration, I think, for ADUs would like to see it go up to 50,000. And then there's a thorny question of, should there be any element of uh, affordability going forward on these ADUs? Or in this context, is it enough to say that we appreciate the fact that you're taking oversized housing and creating another unit of housing for the state of Vermont. As you know, the dilapidated subcode housing that's being renovated requires a five or 10 year affordability concept to it. Five years if you rent to someone coming out of homelessness and 10 years if you uh, rent to low income people who are, who are not homeless. So we could just piggyback on that affordability uh, but the, uh, in my mind, the key thing is to get a certain amount of this money dedicated to essentially a navigation system that will help people develop ADUs. Uh, so I'm big on ADUs. We know that. Yep. On your tombstone, you know it's going to say Michael ADU Sorotkin. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. I would support that. And, and the House could maybe be adding that at the moment. I think it, um, I would not suggest we attach an affordability uh, aspect to ADUs generally. Uh, to the VHIP ones, yes, um, because we already have that in the VHIP program. That's a key piece of the VHIP program. And it is already, as we'll recall, 251 units. Most of them have been 
used once they've been renovated by they have been rented to people who are exiting homelessness. So this is a, a terrific. And at this crisis moment in Vermont's housing history, uh, it's been very helpful. Um, I wouldn't do that with the general ADUs, partly because it's a public private partnership here and it's within your own home. I, I, I think it's a bigger challenge. I think we could consider it once we see, I, I, I just, I wouldn't go there for the ADUs in people's homes, but it's a little different from VHIP. VHIP is landlords. These are external units. These are not necessarily owner occupied. Uh, anyway, I think there are a couple issues that we, uh, I, I would love to use the word, Ellen, as we draft this, I'd get rid of the word ambassador. I'd really keep it consistent that it's a navigation. People get the navigation after the exchange. Navigators, Vermonters are now clear on what navigators do to help them. So I keep I have a very bad name though. Navigator? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I think it's a great, I want people to help me navigate through everything in oh, life. I know, but I think the, when I hear navigator, I hear I think of the health. Uh, I know, but our navigator was health, fabulous. Health care. I, I had I mean, a great. The, the anyway, that's that's one thought. Talk. My second thought is I really want to see us say that if you're going to access a grant from with public money, that it has you have to commit to a long term rent. It cannot be used as a short term rental, and uh, and I think that is for me increasingly a, a, a challenge here that I want to make sure that we don't have a bunch of people developing ADUs in their homes that they use as short-term rental. We, this, we are enabling a good, we are enabling more housing in our downtown and village centers, we hope, and elsewhere. Uh, but I, I really wanted to see it used for long-term rental and it could be three or months, six months, it doesn't necessarily need to be year long, but it needs to be longer term rentals for, P it just, it sticks in the craw to. I, I, I think that's an excellent compromise. I would agree that it's a different animal. You're living in your home. You're not a landlord compared to the renovated, uh, dilapidated home. Um, you're going to get less take up if people have to administer you know somehow i don't know who would check the income eligibility like they're doing now for the rest of vhip but in our caucus we had someone raise the fact exactly what allison was talking about is what's to stop these additional units being put on and just going becoming short-term rentals and the answer that i gave was well in one instance, um, uh, there is uh, each town we passed a law has the right to impose uh, guidelines around short term rentals in their town, but that might not be enough. But then I said this, I'm envisioning this being part of continue to be part of the VHIP program and they have uh, perpetual afford, not perpetual, they have affordability provisions that uh, don't talk about short-term rentals coming in. But now that Senator Clarkson is recommending, we don't piggyback onto those affordability things. I think we can come up with something that says uh, as a condition of the permit that uh, to, to construct this, that there should be, um, that the housing should be used for uh, certain period of duration, I would just say annual leases or six month leases or something like that. Yeah, we've heard from the chamber, we've heard from, I've heard from, I mean, we just heard from Brenda Siegel. Uh, it, it, it is a, it, it's a, a low, it, it's, our housing need is for full-time residents. That's, yeah, that's really where our housing need is. That's what this bill is about. And if we're right. trying to promote ADUs, we don't want them to, not contribute, even though they're an extra unit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on that? Uh, do people want to? Um, is, 20, is, 20, is twenty-five? Is twenty-five percent a good starting point? That could change as we 
go through the process. For VHIP? Uh, yeah. For VHIP? Yeah. Well, 25% of the VHIP money, which is, yeah. if it goes through as the governor wants, it's going to be totaling uh, 20, $20, 20 million, million dollars and maybe more if it includes some more money for this year, but uh, at least $20 million. So I'm saying $5 million should at least go to, this goes, this money goes to nonprofits and then they work Both with- for our five housing partners. Is that a good starting point? I mean, I, we, we, we can change it along the way, but I thought that was a good, good place as any. Yep, I think that's great. Senator Brock, you're muted. I assume the administration made no target number regarding percentage of funding for ADUs? No. Is that correct? But, no. but we no. haven't really discussed it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and, okay. and I will I will ask them if that's a reasonable number. What I don't what I don't want them to come back and say we want total discretion and then just have one ADU built with this money. Uh, I, want Which I think it'd be worthwhile not. asking and looking for some feedback. Absolutely. Yeah, I will do that. Uh, I assume they're listening in, so. <laughs> All right, the last, well, maybe the last section, the missing middle income home ownership development program. Um, this is something the governor wanted $5 million in budget adjustment for neither the House or the Senate felt they wanted to do that without the, the committees of jurisdiction weighing in on what this looks like. I think the intent is good. I mean, it does shift some attention to higher income people and it can create housing. Uh, for sure, the question, as, as you know from yesterday's discussion, which I really apologize with my computer. I don't know why it's not giving me problems today, but uh, Every time I thought I was just getting to the end of someone's testimony to understand what they say, I cut out. <laughs> so, um, but I did have a, a conversation uh, further with CHT. I think I understand right. it, but we have a, we have an issue. There's tension as to what degree of affordability for future homeowners should we uh, put on this money. Right. And I, Chris, think, I think what the administration is proposing is that any subsidy given to the homeowner above and beyond the value gap, uh, that would travel with the house. And the concern from some advocates is that that gets quickly diluted over time. So if a house sold 20 years later, there would be virtually no reduction in the cost of the house and it wouldn't be affordable. The other uh, difference is in, I think the vast majority of homes that have been supported by uh, federal or state subsidy dollars to get people into home ownership is that that money has uh, not only 75% of the appropriation of the appreciation has continued with the house, but it also goes to a low income person or a middle income person. And there's no, uh, nothing in the administration's proposal about that element as well. Uh, so uh, I know that a lot of the stakeholders in this area, including the administration, are involved in discussing this and they're committed to, to meeting over the break uh, as opposed to spending a lot of time now. I would just like to say this area is undecided and let's see what people come up with over the break, if anything. But we will have to decide this issue uh, next Tuesday if, if the stakeholders um, can't come up to it with a solution to our liking. Right. And I just, Mr. Chairman, I yes. add something. 
I just, I really appreciate Chris Donnelly getting back to us because with, with some ideas about where we might build in this permanent affordability. And I'm, I'm hoping that, I don't know who the stakeholders are working on to this together. I assume CHT and, and VHCB and, and obviously the, the administration right. and Vermont Housing Finance Authority. So I assume those four players are working on this. And I, I, just, I, want, I just want to say that I appreciate Chris getting back to us uh, because he's identified the areas that, that we need to, 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 to uh, embed this. Okay, so let's see if we can wrap this up in 10 more minutes. On the chart, it says section 23, down payment assistance. Wasn't that, and then it says section 10 increases. The, isn't this part of the mobile home uh, package that's in an earlier section? Uh, well, no, they're, they're um, <clears throat> the, the manufactured home piece is earlier in the bill. That's for the affordable housing tax credit, and that increases the amount of that and then specifies that 250 of the increase every year should be used for manufactured housing. Section 23 is actually the down payment assistance program and it is doubling the amount available to VHFA through that program in future years. Okay, so I suggest we strike section 23 because I think that may have been a vestige of a previous year's bill. And my understanding is VHFA feels that they're at capacity in the sense of the, because interest rates are rising, that's not as good a tool anymore to address that problem and they don't want any more money to the down payment assistance program at this point. So I don't want to I don't want to force it upon them if the people who who are running it are saying that's not the best way to help people get housing. Right. And I think if we're adding the first generation to this a, a, a bigger umbrella, you know, we're creating a bigger umbrella. I think that that's where our energy should be this year. Okay. But if we go back to the mobile home piece, and this is uh, uh, this $1 million to the affordable housing credit was the um, administration's original proposal. They're now backing off and saying they only want a $250,000 increase and they want the rest of it to come uh as outlined in the uh, section on mobile homes. So there is a, a thankfully a, a, a real good sign off by all the players on the package on mobile home. And it, it does, doesn't do the down pace assistance program, but it does increase the tax credit that, right. was, that was in that the house right. Center of 101, which Senator Brock and I are very familiar with, where they had asked for a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase in that, so that's part of that section on mobile homes. So if we can go back to the sections that Ellen we passed over, uh, David, could you just help me just uh, highlight which sections we passed over that were Ellen's? From uh, go back to the beginning to section two. Yeah, right at the to beginning. The, to the number twos. I, I, you know, before Ellen goes through this to save time, I have never heard any objections to any of these changes to the permitting process uh, raised. There is like, there's a, a handful or more of small tweaks that will just make it easier to permit the bigger biggest ones are the um, I guess the uh, one from going to 25 to 50 uh, in section 2d on priority housing uh, I would ask Ellen to explain that one again and then uh, I don't know if there's others that people have concerns with but there there really are sort of tweaks, I wouldn't necessarily label them 
technical, but I wouldn't label them as major and they just help move along in the permitting process. So having said that, Ellen, could you just do 2D, explain what is going on there? Sure, so currently housing projects that qualify as priority housing projects are exempt from Act 250. There are a number of elements that a project needs to meet in order to um, get that designation and therefore exemption. Currently, there is a cap on the number of units that can be built um, as a priority housing project in the smallest towns. So in towns currently with less than 3,000 people, there is a cap on the number of units at 25 units. Um, this bill removes that cap so that towns up to 6,000 people um, can build priority housing projects up to 50 units. So it's removing the smallest cap in the program. Okay. I thought it said 3,000 people. Right, really? so it's a tiered system. So ah. currently uh, towns with less than 3,000 people have a cap of 25 units. Towns between 3,000 and 6,000 people have a cap of 50 units. Towns with 6,000 to 10,000 have a cap of 75 units. And so it's removing the, sm the smallest cap. So saying all towns with less than 6,000 people, including the smallest towns can build up to 50 units of housing. Okay, I, I, what, I, what I neglected to say is that uh, all of these changes in terms of uh, Act 250 permitting were worked on by uh, a wide range of stakeholders from the state environmental community, League of Cities and Towns, and this was the package of changes that they came up with. Um, so uh, I think this is some of the stuff that's reflected in 511, right? Yes, this did come out of 511. Okay. And, and VNRC, I, I, I think we have Katie's uh, letter posted somewhere. Uh, the, yeah. Okay, back to David. Where, where else did we pass over that would have been in Ellen's jurisdiction? Uh, possibly section 13 is mine. Yeah, is yeah the, section, bylaw. the bylaws. Yeah. Okay, this, uh, there are um, some minor changes here, I think, from what the Senate passed. I don't want to just say this is just a total repeat of what we passed that the governor, uh, that is in 101 that uh, never got enacted. Uh, if you could just highlight the differences in this version versus what's in 101 that the Senate passed. Um, well, the, so your committee and the House did work on the specific language for the Municipal Bylaw Modernization Grant Program. However, as you mentioned, that program didn't pass and get enacted into law. And so the money did get passed. And so the, the department did start issuing these grants. So um, the, la the most recent draft of this bill incorporates some language from the department as well as um, some language from VHCB. VHCB's language um, incorporates references to affordability in uh, the bylaw requirements. And uh, the, there was proposed language changes from the department to reflect what they're actually doing in the program. So some of the elements of the program have changed. Could you highlight what those might be from what we passed in the Senate? Sure, they are in the draft that is posted today, draft 6.1. So, um, so, so first, um, I, I don't think we've actually done a walkthrough of this language. Do you? Okay. Well, but, uh, so, I, mean, I, so I, I, I'm having a hard time summarizing it, but I can, so there are some changes. Um, there are, they're in draft 6.1. But 
so so to receive the grant, I mean, I think there's a variety of changes that are proposed by the, the department here. Um, some, I don't think any of them are huge changes, but they are changes. Um, well, I, I don't think we need to revisit uh, the stuff that we strongly supported in the Senate, but if we could identify the, however you want to help us identify the changes that were made from the Senate version, uh, uh, that would be that would be helpful. So at least we understand. I don't want to necessarily revisit what we passed already, but right. Um, do you want me to put them up on the screen, or do you just want me to? Watch no, we all, I think we all have it in front of us. Whatever's easier okay. for you. So like if you if you turn to page 22 in draft 6.1 so there are some changes uh, so subsection E um, oh so first in subsection D the the funds may be used for the cost of regional planning staff or consultant time and any other approved purpose by the department um, so this is a much short, shorter sentence than the version you passed. The other one was a little more, slightly more detailed. It allowed funds to be used for mapping as well as the, um, the bylaw amendment process itself. Um, so I think potentially both of those two things could fall under any other purpose approved by the department. Um, I, but that is a change. They shortened the list of uses um, and then also in subdivision E, um, they've changed this, the phrasing on how, on what the municipality needs to commit to in the, the bylaw adoption process. So it now reads, a municipality grantee shall use the funds to prepare amendments to bylaws that increase housing choice, affordability, and opportunity and then support a neighborhood development pa pattern that is pedestrian oriented in smart growth areas that reflect the smart growth principles established in 2791 and prioritize projects in designated areas in accordance with chapter 76A. So the previous version of the language that you passed or uh, and then the house worked on did require that there be um, that the town sort of verify that they were not encouraging development in constrained uh, water and sewer areas and that development was going to be located outside of important natural resources and flood hazard areas. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator Clarkson. Uh, that brings to mind Katie's letter, which she, one of her concerns is that we don't define uh, the term smart growth area. Uh, and I just, it just triggered it because Ellen used the term again. Um, I think we might be wise to uh, make sure that we do that and or refer it to the area where it is defined. Can we? So you're right. So smart growth area isn't currently defined in statute, but this bill did, or this, this section of the bill did strongly allude to what a smart growth area is, although I think perhaps that language has been taken out. It was in the big, yeah. wasn't it in the intent section? Or, but I, I think we'd be wise to define it. And if it isn't defined in statute somewhere, we could take a stab at it and it can be refined in the house, but I think it, it might make some sense given how much we're relying on it to define it. I think that we took out, and maybe it was at my request because it was so gray and vague, was the smart growth principles. And by I, I can see that we might want to take I that out. That but may, I think we that, do no, need that to may, that, may, that may have, would have given you more comfort cross-referencing back to it, but we could do it. We either could put that in or we could try and find some definition of smart growth areas, but I agree. 
that uh, you know the uh, uh, an applicant for these funds, you know, may have some dispute with the agency granting the funds as to what smart growth areas are. So maybe we can work on a definition. Do you think that's possible, Ellen? Well, I would need a little more information. I think that there is, it is implicit in this program what is meant by smart growth area because the town is supposed to update their bylaws to increase density in smart growth areas. Smart growth areas is not an official designation, but you are suggesting to the towns that they need to pick areas where they're going to update their bylaws to be, support walkable neighborhood development and denser development. And so you're, this, this allows the towns to say which, are, which areas are their smart growth areas, um, particularly if they don't have a state designated area in the town. So right. I get that. But I, I think there may be examples. I think there may be example language in a prior draft Okay. Um, but I, I, let me suggest that you work with Senator Clarkson on this issue, and maybe you, you could bring Chris Cochran into the conversation. Uh, yeah, and and Katie maybe maybe VNRC the the working group that whoever whoever, whoever, no. whoever, you, whoever you want Senator Clarkson. <laughs> oh well, that's a broad palette. Right. But I you know. Um, okay, let's move on. Anything else in that section? We yeah, should? so one of the other changes is um, they have sort of loosened, I'm, I'm hesitant to characterize how they did this, but the requirements now for what the municipality have to do are a little more vague. So um, a town has to identify municipal water and wastewater disposal infrastructure. They don't need to identify the constrained areas anymore under this language. Um, there was a requirement in the draft that you passed um, to allow duplexes in smart growth areas to the same extent as single family houses. That has been replaced to allow increased housing types and uses, which may include duplexes. Um, again, then on page three, it instead of require parking waivers in smart growth areas, it says include um, parking waivers in smart growth areas. So again, a little bit less strict. Right. And then yeah, section five. Like section. Yeah, section five is, the, is also a bigger change. Um, so this was the section requiring density, which was, this was the flexibility aspect of the density requirement. Back in 237, you had some mandates about density. This version then made it a lot more flexible on how a, a town could meet density. And now it's even more flexible. So a town shall reduce non-conformities by making the allowed standards principally conformed to the existing settlement within any designated area and increase allowed lot building and dwelling unit density by adopting dimensional use parking or other standards that allow compact neighborhood form and support walkable lot and unit density, which may be achieved with a standard allowing at least four units per acre or allowing the receipt of a state or municipal water or wastewater permit to determine allowable density or by other means established by the department. So this is not mandating a density um, this is saying a town could use four acres per unit, or it could um, allow density to be determined by the um, waste wastewater permit in the area. Um, so this is a lot more flexible language. We still have in this program the requirement that they have to be held accountable for what their uh, what they've done with this money to meet the, the statutory requirements before they get the full amount of the money. I remember we had some, I think, I think I'm not mixing apples and oranges here, but I think there was some provision that they would get their last chunk of money upon demonstrating that they've actually accomplished something. 
Um, no. So that, well, it's on the bottom of page 21, subsection C. Um, it's, a, it's again, sort of lighter language than that. It does say funds may be dispersed in installments to ensure the municipalities meeting the goals of this section. So uh, I think it largely accomplishes what you just said, but it isn't the, um, you can't have the money until you show, you've shown you've finished the work. Um, okay. But it does allow uh, installments of the money so that there are check-ins with the town. So the previous one uh, sort of allowed total withholding. This may not, this, this may still have an obligation by the state to give the money, even if they didn't update their bylaws. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, you know, okay. Uh, I, I think I would like to delve into this section a little bit more. Uh, I, I think the, you know, this is part of the problem with the money going out without the program requirements the legislature want. And I think the department is taking uh, the opportunity to loosen this uh, to their liking. I had been told they pretty much followed the Senate version in giving out the money, but it sounds like I, I need to double check on that. Okay, uh, any other sections? Tax credits, I guess, is yours too? Downtown tax? Yes, yes. Okay, why don't we just quickly go through that? Um, so section 14 does raise the cap on the downtown tax credit program to $5 million. Okay. Uh, th this language also includes the new type of tax credit, the flood mitigation project tax credit, which can be up to $75,000. And then the other change is extending this tax credit program to include neighborhood development areas. Okay. So right now in the bill, you're going to need to make a choice because there are the two there are sections that are in conflict here because I presented sort of a choice. You can either add it to the statute, um, this extension to NDAs, or you can do it in session law as a pilot program. Um, if you you know use the pilot program for a set number of years, you can dictate. Uh, the language currently does dictate how much money can actually go to the NDAs from the downtown program. Um, that's currently set at $1 million per $1 million per year. Um, okay, just by way of background for the committee in case people have forgotten in, uh, I think it was also an S101, we passed not only expansion of the breadth of the downtown credits to be eligible to NDAs as well, but we also increased the program, I think it was to Three million seven hundred fifty thousand. My understanding is, I could be wrong. I think the governor's budget has it expanded to five million dollars, as is here, and expanding it to NDAs. Um, we, uh, because of what happened with this in the House, trying to get ahead of the curve here of what we're likely to see. Uh, I'm suggesting it be a pilot program like the house hadn't really, they hadn't really um, passed this, but in ways and means they discussed a pilot program on the expansion to I think two years. I, I've heard some feedback that that's not long enough for the pilot to really work. Uh, you know, they have to get a designation that takes a while. So I would suggest we do this, uh, pilot for NDAs for five years and um, we limit the amount that they can take from uh, from the tax credits to 1 million of the 5 million so we don't dilute the downtowns getting their yes. funding. I, uh, I so. think that's important. Okay. Agreed. And uh, Ellen, I, I confess, I, I just don't fully understand and I, and I think I don't fully appreciate uh, the, diff, the uh, challenge or the choice that is made is how you set it up 
statutorily, but um, session or otherwise, but I'll leave that to your judgment, how you, how you think it's best to do. So I think they probably will accomplish the same goal, however you structure it. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Uh, I don't think we have to go over wastewater because it's that's pretty much exactly as uh, we passed it in uh, 101. Is there anything else, any other sections of yours in the bill? So when I got here, uh, how I, did you discuss all of section 16? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, wow, I thank you all very much. Uh, I will, committee, I will work this up in a new draft, a new chart and get it to you not at the last minute, you know, probably hopefully get it done by Wednesday or Thursday. And so we should be prepared to go through that new draft when we get back. Uh, I'd like to switch, take a break and switch over to economic development, but if people have questions or comments before we do that, we'll we'll, we would take a 10 minute break and start on the economic development bill. Your chair. Senator Ron Hinsdale, yes. Um, just wanted to note that um, I think there's a lot of interest in the land bank language and concept, but a lot of people recognizing that it's probably not ready to be a piece of the bill. Do you mind if I work with David or who, I don't know if David's the right person, but whoever makes sense to draft a study, there have been people recommending different stakeholders that should probably be part of that. Uh, no, I mean, you can do that. I mean, my idea was to, uh, well, we, no, we struck that out entirely. Uh, I'm not adverse to that or the 529 savings account type for first time home buyers, but the, you know, I quickly learned that they're more complicated than what the realtors presented to us and it would take a good deal of time, but certainly, uh, study looking at something like that, maybe even the 529 program as well. Uh, uh, we could put it in this bill or we can certainly send a message to the house. They have a lot more time that they could, that we would be receptive to hearing more about those projects. We just ran out of time. So yes, go ahead and do however you'd like to propose an amendment, that's fine. Yeah, people have lots of opinions about land banks and experiences looking across the country. I can't speak to the 529 piece as much. Like, I don't, wouldn't want to put the same group together to look at both because I don't know that they both have the same expertise. But I, I agree with you. It would be nice to send a message to the Senate to, to look more into that piece. But if I just keep it to the land banks, if, if that makes sense. There's okay. some piece of feedback that's kind of wicked here. Are you hearing that? Kind of very high pitched. That was me. That that was my Roomba for the dog. So I'm trying to stay on mute. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. So let's. Can we come back at ten after eleven? Uh, just get started, and uh, um, time is precious. So even uh, even twenty minutes would be helpful. Great. Thank, thank for you for all your patience.